This is not the uh, only time, of course, that Jesus would ask a question uh, very similar or that dealt with the same issue that he is responding to on this occasion. But I think it is something that is deserving of our close attention with the realization that when there are questions that arise, things with which we must deal with here upon this earth, that the very first place we need to go to deal with whatever it might be is, what does the scripture say about that? Because when we find a wide diversity of things with which we must deal with, it seems like almost constantly, if the scriptures address it, then we know just exactly what we're supposed to think about it. Well, whatever it is, whatever it is. And so many times, I know in my lifetime, I've been an observer of this, and, and those that have lived uh, longer than I have, some many, many, many years longer than I have, they are aware of this significant fact too, that so many times, because there are difficulties that we face in the world in general and things with which we have to deal with and things that, and this is where the rubber usually meets the road, things that we have to attempt to explain to our children and our grandchildren, then the easiest thing for us to do is just play like it's not an existing matter and go our merry way. And, and ultimately though, somebody is gonna be informing them of that particular topic guarantee you and more than likely those that will be informing our kids and our grandkids our nieces and our nephews and those that are younger and maybe not as adept at dealing with things as we are they may not be telling them first and foremost what does the scripture say about that as a matter of fact that might not even enter the conversation at all so you could look at this lesson as being one that was even suggested to me that this is a Sunday night sermon. Well, if you've noticed, it's still sunshiny outside. It's not towards the end of the day. This is not a Sunday night sermon. Now, of course, if I don't quit introducing it for so long, it may end up into a Sunday night sermon. <laughs> but it's not intended to be a Sunday night sermon. Because there are things, obviously, that are more deserving of our attention at a different time of the day than Sunday morning, obviously, but I am not convinced that that is what we're dealing with in this particular lesson. Once again, and of course that leaves the impression here that I'm trying to get you to think that this is something that's been going on frequently for quite some time now. But once again, America's immorality has stolen the spotlight. It truly has. And uh, if we had our druthers, we'd rather the light not even been turned on on this matter, but yet, through no fault of our own, and due to the fact that nobody consulted with me or you or, or even God himself as to this topic, the spotlight has been turned on it anyhow. And it has to do with this particular word and what's associated with this word. Now think about this upon the basis of how we introduced it. Do you think it would be better for us to examine a topic like this with which we are confronted almost on a daily basis, and especially over the last few weeks and months? Do you think it's better to discuss a matter like this in a, in a setting like this, in which we are open and receptive to what God says about everything, including this matter? Or do you think you would rather maybe your kids find out about it at school? from fellow students or horror of horrors from maybe uh, an authority figure at school who is definitely not going to be leading them in the direction as to where the Bible would have us to come on a matter like this. I would say this is the ideal place to deal with it because we're going to be dealing with it on a high and a noble plane, obviously. We're going to be looking at it in light of what the Bible teaches. We're going to try to be balanced in doing that as we have drawn from a number of various sources from good, faithful brethren uh, on this topic, and I think that we will indeed be benefited by our study together. Now, here's what we're talking about when we see the Word. And honestly, folks, when I was a teenager, never in my wildest imagination would I ever known how to use the word transgender. 
But here's what Oxford Dictionary says as far as a definition of what we're talking about is concerned. Denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity does not correspond with the gender assigned to them at birth. Now, we'll be a little bit more specific so there will be no misunderstanding as to what we're talking about or what we are having pushed in our way to deal with in the society in which we live presently and those who are responsible for doing it. Now, here's some facts of the case. And something that I've noticed in my lifetime is that there's some people who the worst possible thing you can do for them is to provide them with facts. As a matter of fact, they run as far as they possibly can away from the facts because they're smart enough to realize that if people were willing to simply accept the facts of the case, then they would not be able to promote what they're presently promoting. So we are determined, and God demands, that we deal with some specific facts of the case. And here are some of those facts. There are estimated in this country, the United States of America, there are some 700,000 folks who claim to be transgender. Somebody says, that sounds like a very large number. Well, it actually translates to two hundredths of one percent who have, and here's a better way, I'm convinced, of looking at these individuals. They have a gender identity problem. That is, they have a problem of identifying with a particular gender, even though they were born and classified as a particular gender when they were born. Now, we're not talking about those small uh, medical problems that do exist from time to time. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about perceptions and feelings as it relates to a particular gender. And here's an amazing statistic, and I actually uh, found this uh, a, a number of weeks ago, and then I started to research it and make sure, in fact, it is the case. But non-biased historical analysis informs us that 80 to 90 percent of young people who question their gender identity spontaneously get over it. Now, here's one thing I think we need to be aware of, which is sort of scary. When you have things like this that happen, it seems as like they just uh, erupted overnight, you know, and all of a sudden here, so I guarantee you, there are going to be more people who are going to begin to question their gender identity because now they are aware that it's all right for them to do that, just like with anything. Because there are other people who are questioning their gender identity. But the amazing thing is, is that when there are individuals who are left to their own devices, they end up growing out of it most of the time, by a large margin most of the time. And there are some specifics involved in that that are deserving of your attention, and, and I submit that you ought to get some good materials and, and read up on this topic for sure. But here's what used to be the case. As a matter of fact, this is the way it was the case from the get-go. I mean from the very instance in which Jesus says, Have ye not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? Those are options. But those are options that's already decided before I have any say-so about it, folks. Or you either. Those are options that are determined when you're born. You are either male or female. But did you realize how quickly this has developed into a, a, a problem that we must deal with is that now Facebook, even, you're not limited to being classified. You're, if you're trying to set your gender identity on Facebook, you're not limited any longer to just two choices that are very narrow and, and very defining and very distinctive from each other. No, friends. As a matter of fact, when you begin to look on Facebook even at all of the possibilities for your gender, I'm not a kidding, folks. 56 plus 2, that's 58 choices you have as to what you want to consider yourself to be. 58 genders? you got to be kidding. I wish I was kidding. I really do. 
But I'm not kidding. These are legally protected gender identities in the good old land of the free and the home of the brave. And nobody has a right to say anything about it without fear of being guilty of a hate crime or discriminating against somebody. Therefore, if a person wants to classify themselves as one of these 58 different things, then we are supposed to let them while at the same time allowing them to use the bathroom of their own choice or the changing room of their own choice. Well, what's the, what's the difference in here? I mean, is, is this really something of which we should be concerned? I mean, is this something that we should actually have a sermon about? I believe it is. Because biblically, traditionally, and commonsensically, there has always been and will always be only two choices. And the choice is male or female, not one of these 58 different choices that you propose for people to make a decision about. And by the way, you know, you could choose one halfway down the list today and turn around and change one totally opposite tomorrow. And who's to say you can't? As a matter of fact, we are being told that it would be wrong for us to say that you could not do that. Some questions that are deserving of our attention that get to the very heart of this matter. Is gender completely different from sex? Or is it so inextricably connected to it that it's an objective matter? Well, sure it is. Here's another question that deals with the same type of idea. Is a person's gender a physical fact and therefore an objective matter? Or is it a mental choice and thus nothing more than a subjective decision that you might make? Which one is it, you know? You know, I've, I've, I've seen uh, some uh, people on television that would ask some of these absurd questions, you know, about how far we go with this, you know. Suppose, you know, I were to claim to be a seven-foot-tall Native American woman. Can I be that if I want to? And on college campuses throughout this land... The consensus is almost unanimous. If that's what I want to be, then I can be that. And thus, I get a break on my college education for sure because I claim to be a female and a Native American. I'm not a female. I'm certainly not seven foot tall. And I don't reckon I've got any Native American blood in my body. Is it really something that is deserving of the attention that it has received in our society today? Now, liberals hate facts. Male and female are not defined by what you feel or by what you think. Never has been, never will be, regardless of what the present culture is promoting. Rather, in direct contradistinction to that, both in male and female are objectively defined as physical anatomical realities. And not only that, if we want to put it in the realm of feelings, and then we're going to have a hard time explaining that why is it that there is a distinction, a clear distinction, in the chromosome makeup of ourselves in which we are either uh, inclusive of the XY chromosome or the XX chromosome, and that is, in fact, an inherited trait that we're born with that cannot be fixed with any surgery. It's still going to be that way. Objective or subjective? A matter of whether I got up on the female side of the bed today or whether I got up on the male side of the bed today or one of those other 58 choices. Well, here's where it really comes down to us. How does it affect us? How does this affect us? And when I say us, I'm not just talking about human beings in general. That's deserving of attention, I guess. But I'm talking about the Lord's church. How does this type of thing affect the Lord's church. And if it does affect the Lord's church, then obviously it's deserving of our attention so that we'll do the right thing and not be adversely affected by it, right? But if it doesn't affect us, then I don't guess we'd even be having this, this conversation, will we? How does this affect the Lord's church? Now, last year, obviously, it was the Supreme Court decision that decided to recognize gay marriages, you know, 
So is this way it's going to be for the next few decades, you know? Is every year we're going to have a landmark decision made by those who would take this country into the cesspool that it's going to right now? Is that the way it's going to be, you know? An is it another notch in the belt of America's political agenda and the more immorality and depravity? Is that what we're going to have to be dealing with from now on? Well, I submit that if it is, then we're going to have to do a better job of educating ourselves and our young people relative to these matters. We're going to have to do it. It doesn't matter whether a large chain of stores like Target says something <clears throat> and changes their bathroom policies or whether the President of the United States says that Title IX is going to be applied to schools and if they do not allow kids to go to the bathroom of their choice, then they're going to have their federal funds removed. It doesn't matter who, who does something like that. You see, it has to get our attention. How does it affect us? Well, here's the first thing I submit. It affects us because it affects our focus. And it'd be wonderful. It would be amazingly great if you did not even have to deal with stuff like that. There's no doubt about it. It'd be wonderful if people would simply get in lockstep with God. If people would be the wise men of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following, who are doers of the word, not hearers only, of those who are open and receptive to what the Lord says do, and they're building the house of their life about what God says. That would be wonderful. But that's not reality. And so our focus instead of being on what it should be on at all times, has to deal with matters such as this. And we must deal with matters such as this. It's not like we can say, well, I'm not even going to say anything, and I'm not going to think anything, and I'm not going to say anything to my kids, and I'm not going to lead them in any direction whatsoever about this matter of transgenderism. I'm just going to hope that ultimately people quit talking about it and everything will settle back down like it was before. That never has worked, you know. Brethren have forever taken that position to false doctrine. Well, we're not directly affected with it right here, so let's just not say anything about it. And, uh, and if it does raise its ugly head here, then we'll just not mention it, and sooner or later it'll die out. Well, that's a cowardly way to approach it, and it's not the biblical way to approach that which is false. We have to address it. We have to address the fact that there are things that are clearly the works of the flesh condemned in such passages as Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, that people in high places are continually promoting as if it is wise and good and acceptable. So we must point out error is error. We must show that bad is bad and that evil is evil and will cost people their souls. But at the same time, we have to realize that instead of looking at the perverts and the quirks in our society, we need to point people to Jesus, who is in fact the person that we're to have the mind of. You know. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Would Jesus address the flagrant and violent sins of a society? Well, sure he would. But would that take all of his attention? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Neither can it take all of our attention as well, you know. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Did, did Paul? He's the one that gave us the list of those works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 6. But yet he was balanced in his approach. He realized that the cure for the transgenderism and the homosexual marriages and every other deviation from God's original plan was Jesus Christ and him crucified. And thus, that balanced approach was what characterized the Apostle Paul. It's easy because it seems as though we are co constantly being bombarded almost on a weekly basis with something new. It's easy for us to spend all of our time in addressing those things. But that wouldn't be proper. That would put us in the position of being imbalanced, and we don't want to be imbalanced. And also, keep this in mind, I love this country. I do believe from my examination that the particular type of government that exists in the United States of America is without a doubt the ideal government structure in which Christianity could and should flourish. But my allegiance is not to the United States of America. No. I support this country for sure. And some people have taken the sad position 
America, love it or leave it. If you don't like what's going on, then keep your mouth shut or move. Well, that's not biblical either, you see. Because it is a government by and for the people. We do have a right and a, to say so about what's going on. But just as the other examples prove us, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's where our focus must, not what, who's president, you know, not what comes out of the Supreme Court. It matters, but that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is upon Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when our focus is adversely affected off of the salvation of men's souls, then it needs to be redirected back to the salvation of men's souls, even those who are mixed up about who they are gender-wise, for sure. Secondly, <clears throat> this affects the Lord's church because it challenges what the Bible says relative to the roles of men and women. It really does. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 3 at verse 15, Paul told Timothy that the church of the living God is the family of God. We know, and we've usually used this terminology, as goes the home, so goes the nation. Well, we've added our uh, in-between there into that analysis too. As goes the home, so goes the church. And when there are direct attacks upon the family structure, upon the roles of husbands and wives, upon males and females, then that's a direct uh, attack upon the very structure of society, an attack upon the structure of which the church is composed. Families. Families created as God intended for them to be. And along with that, everything that is supposed to go on within the family unit. That wives are to submit unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. That husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That fathers are to not provoke their children, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that they are to so correct their children in, in, the, in the way that would lead them to be faithful children of God themselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 through 12, we see that the head of every man is Christ, the head of Christ is God, and the head of the woman is the man. That's a divine pecking order. It doesn't speak to there being any difference as far as value of those individuals. But here's the design that God had from the very beginning is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning verse 8 through 15. When we have an attack upon the roles of women and men in society, then that is a direct affront to God's decision making abilities in the very beginning for stable society. Therefore, it is deserving of our attention from that standpoint for sure. And of course, in Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, we see one of the roles of older women is to teach younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. Whenever we fail to follow this divine prescription for happiness and success in the family, then we're failing to avail ourselves of instruction that will ensure that the congregation is composed of these families or what God would have them to be. Thus, this is another way this attacks us as well. And also, thirdly, transgenderism provides for us an easy sin to speak out against. I mean, really, how long do you have to think about it before you figure out this is just not right? It's not that, not that long, is it, you know? I mean, I guess there are people who have a hard time wrapping their head around it because they're not plugged in to what the Bible says about anything anyhow. But this is pretty simple, it seems to me, as to see how sad and far removed society has gone that even things like this continue to happen. And with so much approval. At the same time, there are specific gender roles in our families that are being violated on a regular basis. Oftentimes, without even any acceptance or realization that it's taking place. Which is exactly the reason we had point number two. You know. Are we so satisfied with the job that we're doing as men and women of God that it's easy for us then to jump on the bandwagon, so to speak, and to speak against these deviations from God's original plan and transgenderism, you know? It's pretty easy to holler foul 
Well, at the same time, we elevate our own faithfulness in this regard so many times. What do you mean by that? Well, how about this? Is every Christian man the spiritual leader, the spiritual, the spiritual husband, and the spiritual father that he needs to be? How about if we were to say, probably not? Well, isn't the Christian father and husband, isn't he supposed to be the spiritual leader of his house? Well, sure he is. So when he's not the spiritual leader of his house, when he's not the spiritual uh, person that he's supposed to be in his home, and with those that are looking to him for, for guidance, then is that not likewise a deviation from God's original model and plan? Well, sure it is. But yet it's easy for us to jump on and oppose transgenderism, obviously, while at the same time being self-satisfied, oftentimes with our own failures in that regard. That's not good, you know. And what about women? Is every Christian woman the spiritual example of what a wife and a mother is supposed to be? Or do women from time to time have difficulty submitting to their own husbands as unto the Lord and have a problem of dressing modestly and, and other problems as well, but yet it's easy to jump all over transgenderism because it's such a clear deviation from God's original pattern that we are satisfied that in comparison to that, we're doing all right. That's not the right idea to either say. You know, we can become quite confident in our own selves while not fulfilling God's design for us too. But we can, with a united voice, holler against these deviations that are in the news. Don't do you think there might be a little bit of consistency demanded and a little less hypocrisy allowed? Certainly so. In other words, we can defend what the Bible says about the family but then we can take a position that doesn't expose our failures to be what God would have us to be. That's a problem. And it's, you can put it another way. By us not being transgender, then that makes, that's, it makes the statement that says that we are obedient unto God in everything that we do. Well, of course, that's not the case. That's not the case. But if it allows us an easy out that we can holler against something that we're not guilty of, while at the same time failing to acknowledge that which we fail in, then that's always going to be a problem with such things as obviously wrong as transgenderism. How does it affect us? Number four, it can affect in the minds of many people the perception of what the church is all about. You know, Well, we, we even mentioned in the Bible class this morning concerning the attitude that many people exhibit sometimes relative to assembling with the members of the Lord's church at a, at a worship service like this because they say, well, there's hypocrites there, you know. In other words, they're willing to judge a whole group of people by one or two bad apples, you know. Of course, that's the only area that we allow that to happen, you know. Are there some hypocrites that pull for the Tennessee Volunteers? I refuse to go to Neyland Stadium because there's hypocrites there. Well, nobody's ever done that, you know. But yet it's all right if it comes to spiritual matters for some reason, for some reason. Is it possible that people would look at us and how we deal with matters like this and then based upon what we do or what we fail to do, they make a determination about the whole group based upon us? Well, you know, see, there's two sides to even that angle. Somebody can say, well, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, guess what? It may be that's exactly what a Christian is, and they don't want to have anything to do with genuine Christianity. Or it may be that their perception of what Christianity is is not being demonstrated by a person that claims to be a Christian. And thus, our failures and our hypocrisy actually stand in the way of a person being more responsive and open the teaching of the truth. Will people make a judgment based upon what you or I do or fail to do? Sure they do. Well, what about with something like this? You know, do our attitudes and do our actions sometimes have eternal effects? Well, sure they do. 
Do they have positive effects? Sometimes. Do they have negative effects? Sometimes too. You know, are we supposed to balance them out? Try not to have any more negative effects than we got positive effects? And somehow that'll get us by? You know, we clearly, obviously, have an obligation, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that you will meet us of here. You know. When somebody asks us, well, what do you think about this transgender movement? Then we need to be able to provide book, chapter, and verse reasoning as to why we stand opposed to it. We should be satisfied to be men, created men in God's image. We should be satisfied if we're created women and women created in the image of God. And those respective roles that God has prescribed for us will bring honor and glory unto him when they're respected and his directions are followed. And we need to be able to say that clearly and in such a way that people cannot misunderstand what we're saying. But at the same time, in Ecclesiastes 1 at verse 9, when this particular movement moves from front page news, what's going to be next? Who knows? Who knows? There's not really anything new under the sun, is what Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. It's simply a rehashing and a return of deviancy of a previous time. That's all it is. Over and over and over again. And if we get to the point where we face some obstacle to what's right and good like this, and it leads us to pull our hair out, then what are we going to do when the next issue comes up and we ain't got no hair to pull? You see, we got to be careful. I guess the wisest advice would be in a general way from the Apostle Paul when he says we need to redeem the time. We need to make use of the time that God has given us to oppose that which is wrong for sure but to not waste our time in our attempts to turn people back to the way that God would have us to go. So the question maybe should be asked a different way and maybe another question. How does the transgender movement affect the church? Maybe, just maybe, we need to ask, how does the church affect the transgender movement? Ooh, I believe there's something for us to work on. Because we can see the detrimental effects of individuals who are not willing to simply follow the Bible's guidance. But they should. And we should be the first ones to lead them to see that for their own benefit, not only in eternity, but now, the best thing to do is to do God's bidding. It provides for health, for happiness, and comfort, not only here, but of course, eternally, in a wonderful place called heaven. God has a simple, simple plan. It begins with hearing the right thing, which is God's word, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But more than just hearing it, we've got to believe what we hear. Inclusive of the fact that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. That must lead us to be willing to repent of our sins, to make an about face in our life, to stop serving ourselves and Satan and our selfish desires and start serving the Lord. To be willing to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, just as the Ethiopian nobleman did, as recorded for us in Acts chapter 8 at verse 37. That puts us in the position where the, that we now can be scripturally baptized into Christ. Where his blood was shed, finding contact with that precious blood, rising to walk in the newness of life as the Lord adds us to his church. Maybe in times past that simple plan you obeyed, but have wandered away. You've been blessed with an opportunity today to return to the fold of safety, to be restored to a right relationship with God. The repentance, confession, and prayer, the way back is provided for the erring child of God. If you're subject to heaven's invitation anyway, let us know how we can assist you while together we stand and while we sing.